Thank you very much indeed, Ralph. Well, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Um, what a wonderful turnout. I know that it's still, uh, it's still not quite the end of eighth week, so it's very good to see a number of faces from the, uh, from the student and the faculty body. Um, I'd like to introduce Tupton Jimpa, whom I was just a minute ago trying to remember where and when we first met. Well, I'll never forget where we met. <laughs> Uh, but when it was, well, it was in the winter of 1988, and it was in Copenhagen. And the first evidence that I, have, I had of Jim Perp before actually meeting him was a book left on the bed, which was called The Left-Handed Universe. I thought, that sounds pretty cool. I wonder who owns that book. It turned out to be this young monk who was uh, translating for His Holiness. And uh, we immediately fell into conversation. And in a way, you could say the conversation hasn't stopped. Um, uh, Jimpa is one of my oldest and, uh, I could say, closest friends. We've been in all kinds of strange situations together, and we've done all kinds of ridiculous things together. Uh, <laughs> uh, from croquet on uh, Clare College lawns at three o'clock in the morning in Cambridge, <laughs> to punting and falling out of boats. I even can say that I rode the Cresta Run with Tubton Jimpa. <laughs> You know, this uh, ice, ice uh, track in St. Moritz where you go down on the uh, equivalent of a, of a sort of, I wouldn't say a, a motorised, because it's not motorised, but a, a high-speed tea tray. Um, and uh, what else have we done together? Well, I, it's too long and too numerous to, to recall. But um, really, this, this book that Jimper has written is the book that... I've always wanted to see him write. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but uh, there is distilled into this book the wisdom not of just uh, the past 28 years or the past 30 years or the past 50 years. There's really wisdom that goes right back uh, two and a half thousand years, but it's, it's expressed and it has, it has recapitulated this wisdom for a modern audience in a way that uh, nobody but Jinpa could have done it. Um, it's, a, it's a book that draws from his family life, from his, uh, his childhood as a, as a young refugee in India in the early 60s. It draws on Tibetan history, but it draws also on the Western philosophical tradition. It draws on science. It is a profoundly rich book, which I recommend to you if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Uh, it draws together so many different strands. But one of the things that I, uh, I suppose the thing that I most like about uh, Jimper and Jimper's approach to the subject is the, the earthiness of it. And this is one of the things that I've always, that has always attracted me, if you like, to the, tr to the Tibetan tradition. It's earthiness. It's real life. It's not something merely, it's not something conceptualized. It's something that is, that is in the soil, it's in the blood, as much as it's in the mind. And Tupton Jimpa very brilliantly encapsulates that. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Tupton Jimpa to speak to us. Uh, he'll do so for about 40 minutes. And then afterwards, if anyone's got any questions, he'd be happy to take them. Tupton Jimpa, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Alex, for your very warm words of welcome and um, introducing me. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I know, uh, having been a Cambridge student myself and a fellow there, I know that uh, the term hasn't finished yet. And so the fact that many of you came here to spend this evening with us here uh, is, is a real honor for me. So thank you. Um, um, I'm also very uh, grateful to the Dalai Lama Center for, um, for Compassion here in Oxford for hosting this event. Um, I, my book was published in this country last month, and um, although my main publisher is an American one, Penguin, the British publisher, Piatkas, which is part of Little Brown, uh, really persuaded me to come through uh, UK just briefly to try to give the book a little push. Um, and I suppose they felt that uh, my name was perhaps too associated with um, 
Buddhist books and uh, they really wanted me to come over to probably try to convince the non-Buddhist audience that I can write book for general <laughs> readership as well. So anyway, I said yes and uh, so this is, I'm here as part of that book uh, promotion. So basically I'm here in Oxford tonight and then London, basically London and Oxford. So, and I'm very happy um, to be invited by uh, the center here and I see in the center as uh, presence here a real potential for taking the conversation on compassion really much further and uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm very enthusiastic about the fact that there is a Dalai Lama Center for Compassion here in Oxford and I know um, you know Alex has worked very hard and this afternoon I met with the core team uh, of the Dalai Lama Center and I was very impressed by the depth of their dedication and the range of their interest and the far-sightedness with which they're thinking about the whole mission and that is really now part of the Dalai Lama Center here. And, um, you know, I feel, you know, although Alex did say that, uh, you know, I was the perfect person to write this book, which I'm not quite sure, um, but I do feel tremendously privileged to be able to write this book um, because compassion has been a very important a topic for me um, uh, for a long long time you know um, ever since I began conscious as a young child from the age of six my memory goes back up to age six um, you know I've been very very conscious of the role of compassion because when I was growing up in Tibetan refugee school in Shimla um, uh, the school that was run uh, where, where I was a, a member was actually uh, funded by, I found out, Save the Children's Fund, mm -hmm. which is an organization that is supported by many ordinary British citizens like yourself. Um, and uh, we were about 200 students uh, at this Tibetan children's school uh, called Stirling Castle. It was in a beautiful hilltop location uh, just outside Shimla, um, in a, which was based on two colonial style kind of resident homes, which were you know, combined together. And also later growing up um, in, my, in, the, in the big school and then later in South India where my monastery moved down, um, the presence of um, grain sacks or rice sacks with Catholic Relief Service label on them were very, very prominent. So, you know, by that time, because I had gone only up to grade five, I was able to read. Uh, my English was good enough to be able to read. So, I, 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 so the presence of other people's you know, compassion and its impact was very real in my everyday, you know, growing up life. Um, and also, uh, I have really fond memories of a few individuals who have you know, played a key role in my life. I remember when I was about uh, 17, I came across this German woman who came to visit my monastery. Uh, by the name of Dr. Valentina Steig, um, Stark. She was an Indologist with a facility with Chinese studies, uh, an anthropologist, and she, you know, took it up on herself to assist me in the development of my English. You know, here I was in South India in one of the Tibetan settlements. There were hardly anybody who spoke English. Um, you know, I was a member of a small monastery. I was about, uh, you know, 16, 17. And, uh, you know, we had to work in the road uh, fields and building the trenches and planting trees and working in the fields. And, and uh, the only English I had was listening to BBC World Service every day, religiously trying to kind of, you know, in a Tibetan monastic tradition, we do a lot of memorization. So that was the only technique we have. So I was basically memorizing sentences and words. And this German woman who came to visit the monastery really took it upon herself to help me. She would send me books, she would invite me down to Bangalore. She was married to the director of um, Pune, uh, Max Muller Institute then. And then uh, I also came across uh, my own future teacher, Zemir Rinpoche, who was a great poet and a learned scholar who again took me under his wings. So, you know, looking back, uh, these two, you know, people in my life played a, such a powerful role in shaping who I later became. So, you know, of course, these, you know, these people were doing completely out of their compassion and kindness. So, the compassion was a very important force in my life. And of course, you know, later on when I had the accidental honor to 
serve His Holiness as his principal interpreter, you know, I began to realize that alongside world peace, his central message is the message of compassion. So in other words, I really had an opportunity to, you know, have a kind of a front seat view of what it means to live a truly compassionate life on, on a kind of a day-to-day -day practical level. And, um, you know, having worked with His Holiness for now, this October is going to be 30 years, you know, I know that we as individual human beings can become more compassionate than we are. And sometimes in the West, when we think about being compassionate, we tend to think in terms of moral values. We tend to think in terms of, you know, a good person, duty, you know, someone who's more like a godlike. But so there's a kind of an association of some kind of struggle, you know, self-sacrifice and, and, you know, sort of um, taking on more pain. and and. In the West, when we think about compassion, joy doesn't figure in our conception of what it means to be compassionate. But if you look at someone like His Holiness, who is truly compassionate, but at the same time, on a daily basis, he's a truly happy man. So that juxtaposition of being truly compassionate naturally, but at the same time having this sense of joy, true joy, that was intriguing for me as well growing up. So, so all of these really it was in my mind, and of course in the Buddhist tradition, uh, some of you are familiar with the Buddhist tradition, compassion is really seen as one of the most important spiritual values, if not the most important value. And in some sense, one could argue in the Buddhist tradition, you know, compassion is the fundamental value which underpins all other ethical values and virtues. So in some sense, compassion is the foundation and everything else is seen as coming out of it. So there is that kind of, you know, um, extolling the virtue of compassion in the tradition itself. But, of course, all of these were very much part of my life, but I never really thought I would actually be working in compassion as a kind of a, a, a topic in itself. Um, and then I came here to Cambridge to study as an undergraduate. Um, Yash is here, Sylvia is here, we were together at King's. They were graduate students, I was undergraduate, so of course in Cambridge and Oxford there's hierarchy, is very important. <laughs> so, um, but I did philosophy, and in, unlike Oxford where you have PPE, uh, philosophy, uh, politics, what, how, how do you call it? Philosophy, politics and economics. In Cambridge, philosophy is just pure philosophy, it's tripos, <coughs> nothing but philosophy. So of course you end up attracting very, very sharp, brilliant students who are part of that course. And one of the things that intrigued me was a course on ethics where the professor talked about psychological egoism. Now those who don't, are not familiar with philosophical jargon, psychological egoism is a kind of a philosophical standpoint that basically argues that ultimate explanation of every human behavior must be reduced or is reducible to pursuit of self-interest. And uh, so, and, and people genuinely believed in this. And I remember having arguments, you know, with my, some of my fellow students. And once I cited the example of uh, Mother Teresa and one of them, I mean, they're all very bright and sharp. And uh, my English wasn't that fluent at that time. And one of them said, but Jimpa, don't be silly, you know, even in the case of Mother Teresa, there must be something in it for her, because otherwise, why would she be doing it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, so there was this kind of, almost a kind of a, a, a reluctance to allow the possibility of reality of true selfless human behavior. And there was this uh, idea that somehow, if you haven't found the ultimate self-interest motivation behind a particular action, that somehow you haven't found the final explanation of that behavior. And this was a, a, a deeply held view. And then digging more deeply into the literature behind this, of course, then there was a whole world there with, based on Darwinian evolutionary theory and the rhetoric of the survival of the fittest and you know, all of this. And, and then, of course, Huxley seemed to have played a powerful role in making Darwinian a particular reading of Darwinian evolution theory becoming most dominant. And all of this meant that, you know, co characteristics like altruism and compassion were either seen as somehow not real or something like, almost like an aberration that we might eventually be able to explain away. 
So the explanation of the, re, you know, the phenomenon of altruism was effectively a form of explanation that would explain it away. So that was actually for me quite disturbing actually, that the fact that people were not even willing to entertain the possibility that there might be truly selfless human behavior. And then uh, I came across this, uh, you know, rather notorious but quite famous quote from an American psychologist who said, scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. <laughs> so there was this, uh, I mean, this was a kind of a, and, the, and it turns out, if you think about it, this was the, the popular narrative that society, as a society, we are bought into that really is the framework within which we were trying to understand human experience and particularly you know, human behavior. And so looking back, I noticed that the contemporary culture, particularly in the West, seemed to have a very conflicted relationship with qualities like compassion and altruism. Because on the one hand, you know, Western society is very deeply shaped by Christian sensibilities, you know, irrespective of whether as an individual you are, see yourself as a believer or not, but the Christian sensibility deeply informs the way in which even the English language, you know, terms like conscience and, you know, forgiveness, all of these have a very deep root in Christian sensibility, so which meant that there was a widespread admiration of qualities like compassion and altruism. There is that, because that's part of the cultural heritage. But on the other hand, you have this almost of a kind of a schizophrenic attitude of another narrative, which is coming more from the science and the Darwin, popular reading of Darwinism, as well as the economic theory, which you know, is built upon this, which says that we are all essentially you know, creatures whose ultimate interest is the pursuit of self-interest. You know, so, so there was this, you know, and then, so compassion, qualities like compassion and altruism gets relegated either into a religious domain where it becomes part of a value. So if you're a believer, then you should be behaving like this. So you, they are seen as kind of a moral values, which if you subscribe to that moral system, then you should take it seriously or you relegate to an informal context of family relationship where you expect parents to treat their children kindly and compassionately, but you don't expect this within the society from others. So, so what this happens is that we as a culture in the West and society, we haven't fully developed a robust discourse on compassion. And I think the time has now come that this discourse has to take place. And this is where I feel that the kind of work that His Holiness has done over now 30, 40 years of trying what he calls the promotion of secular ethics, which is an appreciation of the key human values independent of any particular religious framework, I think has been a very important, you know, kind of contribution. And now, the time is right to have this conversation on compassion because many factors are coming together. One is, you know, those of, you know, who are familiar with the mindfulness movement, you know, are aware that how in this amazing revolution of mindfulness, we have seen even the, you know, a large sector of the, you know, you know uh, secular culture, you know, taking on board the idea that you as an individual can a proactive approach to dealing with your own mental issues by developing certain skills of focused attention, being able to disengage yourself from the contents of your thought, you know, having a kind of a more detached perspective so that you have a space. So these kind of things are now being seen in the healthcare context, you're increasingly be seen in the education domain. So there's already a kind of a cultural receptivity to the kind of idea that generally tends to come from the East, particularly from the Buddhist tradition, where through meditation techniques and mental training techniques, individuals can take charge of their own mental life. So that, those kind of, there's a much greater receptivity. So compassion has that capacity to be again accepted, because there's a, in the Buddhist tradition, just as there's a very rich resource on cultivation of mindfulness, there's also a tremendous resource on cultivation of compassion. 
and loving kindness in the Buddhist tradition. So there are the resources there, and I think there is going to be a greater receptivity, and I see the current you know, movement on compassion and its cultivation that is increasingly taking hold. At the moment, more in North America, particularly in the West Coast of the United States, where I worked at Stanford. But I think gradually it's coming this way as well. But I suppose before it comes here, it has to go to New York, New York area, um, because they're probably a better, you know, better test. Uh, anyway, so, so that's one important movement. And the second thing is that, you know, those who are in the field of science, particularly in neuroscience, know that the, in the last 15, 20 years, there has been a tremendous revolution in, the, in, the, in neuroscience and, and cognitive science with the emergence of sophisticated imaging technologies like fMRI and EEG, we now have the techniques to be able to look at brain as it were in action, you know, brain in function. And those kind of capacities were not there in the old days. And that gives the neuroscientist and the you know, psychologist a powerful tool to look at you know, brain processes and how they manifest, and in, whether in relation to health or mental well-being or whatever. So there is that powerful technique, uh, uh, technical tools. And that kind of revolution also took place alongside a conceptual revolution, where there was a discovery of neuroplasticity. The fact that brain is pl plastic and it can adapt to based on experience and, and environment and that there's a birth of new neurons, even in your 80s. And it turns out one of the most effective you know, method for neurogenesis is really physical exercise. Physical exercise beats everything, meditation or any, everything. Mm -hmm. So even in your 80s, there, 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 there are births of new neurons. So in the old days, we used to think about neuroplasticity only in terms of formation of new synaptic connections. But now, when they're talking about neuro plasticity, they're also talking about birth of new neurons. So, so this discovery of neuroplasticity and the language around it really gave the neuroscientist and psychologist a completely different conceptual framework within which they can understand the mechanisms by which conscious mental training like meditation can really impact the brain. Because until that time, it was like a misery. misery. Okay, you close your eyes, you do the meditation, and then it's basically pre and post. So whatever you know, studies you want to do, whether it's in the health context, the studies were very crude. You do a pre, you know, a test of some health outcome measures, then you give the intervention, then after the interventions are over that period, then you take the measurements again and to see if there is any impact. I mean, there is going to be some impact because there's a lot of other things going on. You know, there's a group dynamic going on. There is a more personal interaction with the t instructor going on. So we don't know where the effects are really coming from, whether they're coming from the actual meditation practice or whether they're coming from the fact that people are just getting together and having a good time. We don't know. But now with the, you know, these new development in neuroscience, there's a way in which the scientists can begin to even think about what might be the mechanisms through which these changes are taking place. So all of this, plus even in basic science itself, there is a big debate going on about revisiting the whole question of where does altruism fit in. And uh, you know, those of you who are scientists uh, will know that there is a very esoteric debate going on right now called uh, multi-level selection versus inclusive fitness. It's a sort of very esoteric debate, but basically, at, you know, how does the selection mechanism operate in evolution, whether it is, operates at a multiple levels, which is one perspective, the, or the other one is still at the individual level, but it ha includes fitness there. So this basically, the, the, in, in plain English, the debate is really about whether we can allow truly altruistic active, you know, behavior or not. And now the interesting thing is that some of these challenges are really coming from non-human primate science, science, where they are beginning to discover the presence of some kind of empathy, even in animal. So some of you might have seen that very amazing um, video clip from Franz de Waal, who is a, a primatologist from uh, Emory University. And he has this video which shows that two, you know, um, 
teenage uh, um, apes uh, fighting each other and one of them loses really badly and then is sulking and another one comes by and who has no blood relation and gives him a hug and consoles him. Yeah. Now, if, if this is a consoling behavior, <coughs> very sophisticated processes are going on. To console presupposes an empathetic you know, perception on the part of this other, other, other aid and reaching out, all of this. So all of this, and on top of that, um, there is a team of uh, two German scientists from Max Planck Institute who collaborated on uh, an ongoing project where one of them looked at primates and the other non-human primates, the other one looked at very young child, um, 14 months old children, children, to see whether children spontaneously engage in helping behavior. <coughs> and the experiments are quite simple actually. One of the ex experimental scenes involves uh, someone trying to hang a cloth on a dry, you know, clothesline and accidentally drops a clothes pin and pretends can't reach it and there's a child nearby and the child sort of looks up and looks at the clothes pins and walks over and gives it, you know, spontaneously. And another scene, uh, there's an the experimenter carrying a stack of, you know, magazine and wants to put them in, in, in a kind of a cupboard but can't open the door because his hand is full and then looks at the child and the child looks at and then opens the the door so that the, you know the person can put so this help you know spontaneous helping behavior can be observed now interesting thing is when the children are rewarded then they don't tend to repeat it that often <laughs> so there is a lesson for new parents you know <laughs> you know when when our children were growing up um, you know my wife is not Tibetan so we have a kind of a slight cultural different perspectives and uh, I said to her, I said, you know, if you don't mind, I said, I don't believe in this reward for chore business. And I said, uh, we will, if, when the time comes when they're old enough to give pocket money, we will just give pocket money, but we will expect them to do the chores that they are capable of, but we're not going to correlate a chore with a reward. And then later when I found that study, I was, I felt good actually. <laughs> So, and then another interesting study that was done was, um, uh, this was done in the, in, in the Princeton, uh, Yale area, New Haven. Um, children as young as six months old, they were shown videos uh, of cartoon characters, uh, and there's a kind of a hill, and one cartoon character, and they're all animated, so they have eyes and kind of mouth so that they can see that it's not just an object, but they're animated. So the, the scene involves, you know, one of the objects trying to climb up and then f keeps falling down and then another object comes from back and pushes it up and help it. So that was one scene. In another scene, the same thing happens. Now this time another object comes from the top and blocks it and pushes, pushes it down. And then after that the children were given the choice to choose which of the toys they want. Children inevitably in or invariably chooses the helping toy. And they, 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 they did it with all sorts of variations, different colors, different shapes. So there seems to be a real bias or preference at such an early age for helping behavior as opposed to hindering behavior. So all of this is to say that, you know, this instinct to care, this instinct to help seems to be deeply, deeply rooted. Now, of course, as philosophers, one could debate, it's a culturally acquired, da 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 What the fact is, they are very deeply rooted. So I think this idea that somehow the most fundamental part of our nature is the you know, pursuit of self-interest, and competition is the most fundamental expression of human behavior, I think is too simplistic. You know, at least, in the least, on the same level, you know, you cannot have a full picture of human behavior and human nature if we don't include on equal footing the role nurturing and caring instinct plays and how that manifests in cooperative and helping behavior. So just as we have competition which expresses this pursuit of self-interest, cooperation expresses this, you know, nurturing, caring part of our nature. And you cannot, you know, I mean, I don't think as a philosopher 
I could argue that you cannot have a full picture, you cannot claim to have a full picture of human nature without taking into account both of these sides of our nature. Because, and there's, there is an economist um, uh, by the name of Ernst Fair, uh, he's a Swiss economist, and um, he came up with this idea of what he calls altruistic punishment, which is, almost sounds like oxymoron. <laughs> but the point he's trying to make is that if you built a computer model, a game, where only the classical economic theory of human nature, which is profit maximization under every situation, is built in, then you have 10 people playing game. After a few rounds, the whole game breaks down because you have one or two defectors who never cooperate, then people don't you know, cooperate further. The whole game breaks down. If you introduce one element where any of the participants have the possibility to spend more money in the game and force the defector to pay double. Now, from an individual point of view, the person who is penalizing the other person is actually sacrificing. Because if each player is given 10 pounds, and he is spending more than his other colleagues, but because he hates this other guy who keeps def you know, defecting all the time, he has the chance to punish him by spending more money and forcing him to spend the double. Once you introduce this element, then the cooperation game goes on for a long time. So that his argument is that unless you bring in some role altruism plays in the evolution of human uh, cooperation, large-scale cooperation simply cannot be explained. So these are things that are emerging, all of which is to say now the discussion on compassion and altruism is a very different one. And I think the time has come for us, and particularly academic institutions like Oxford, to really take this seriously. Um, because up until now, I think our picture of human nature and our story of who we are as a species is not only too simplistic, but also it's not very flattering to ourselves. <laughs> it's not a very flattering, or flattering picture of who we are as a species, to the suggestion that somehow we are ultimately you know, motivated only by the pursuit of self-interest. I think that is too simplistic. So I had been privileged to be part of uh, a center at Stanford, um, which had played a very important role in really bringing compassion and altruism squarely within the legitimate field of scientific inquiry. And now the people who are involved in research on compassion is a very broad discipline. You know, people, non-human primate scientists, child developmental psychologists, neuroeconomists, these are subgroup of economic, uh, economists who are trained as economists, but they use neuroscientific methods like brain imaging technology to understand human economic behavior. So these are known as neuroeconomists. So you have also Buddhist scholars who are, you know, whose role are more in two areas. One is to help with the constructs or the concepts that are involved. For example, you have compassion, sympathy, empathy, altruism, kindness. So, you know, if science is going to get involved in this area, you know, science needs clarity. You know, what are we talking about? So here, I think the Buddhist tradition has tremendous resource to offer because, um, you know, compassion and its associated, you know, qualities have been a major area of interest for the Buddhist tradition. And so I think this whole area, um, and then there are neuroscientists who are also looking at the brain mechanisms that are involved uh, in experience of empathy versus compassion um, and, and so on. And for example, one of the key insights that has come from the Buddhist tradition, which I think is now being taken seriously, is that in compassion, one of the key element is that sense of identification with the other. And <clears throat> without that sense of identification for the other, you cannot feel empathic concern. And without empathic concern, you are not, you are not going to act out of kindness. Now, and this, and the point here is that the way we perceive someone is going to inevitably shape the way we feel about that person. So this 
if you're not able to identify with the person in front of you, you're not going to feel compassion. And, and we know this from, for example, if you look at the history of tribalism in human story, when two tribes are fighting against each other, you know, the way in which they do that is the one member of the tribe has to somehow completely objectify the other members of the tribe so that you switch yourself from making a human connection to the individual members of the other tribe. That's what makes, you, makes it possible for you, you as from this member of the tribe to do horrible things on the other without feeling morally damaged. So, so identification with the other is the key factor and here there's a very interesting uh, research. Um, am, how, how far I'm, am I okay? Um, and it's, it's in some sense the research is a bit silly but simple. And this was done in, in the United States. Two uh, cohorts uh, sit in front of a table like this, each looking at their own computer mon uh, you know, monitors. And they are both listening to music through the headphone. And they are asked to tap their fingers listening to the music. Now, in one set of experiments, the two people are listening to the same music at the same time, so which means they will end up tapping their fingers in synchrony. The another set of experiments, they are listening to completely different music, so that means they, are, they see each other, but they will be tapping fingers in total, you know, no synchrony at all. And after this, then they were asked to write, rate how they felt about their partner and all the rest. And then the experimental setting involves accidentally one of the experimenters penalizing the, one of the partners unjustly, unfairly. And then they you know, judge the response of the partner. What they found was in the situation where people tapped their fingers in synchrony, you know, they reported liking their partners much more. And on top of that, you know, when the partner was unfairly penalized, they were much more disposed to help and, and defend. So it seems silly, but on the other hand, it does make sense. And the only commonality that they perceived is the tapping the fingers in synchrony. So what this suggests is the trick here is to be able to see that shared similarity. So that we, it, it gives us the basis to empathize and connect with this other. So that's why in the Buddhist meditation on compassion, Tibetan uh, version particularly, a key active ingredient in that practice is a very simple meditation where you say, just like me, he doesn't want to suffer. He wishes to be happy. Just like me. Almost like a mantra. It's a very simple practice, but you can see the power. Because if you are able to see another person just as another human being, whose basic aspiration is to be happy and to wish to avoid suffering, you are able to relate to that person at the level of basic humanity. It doesn't really matter whether that person speaks your language or not. And that allows the possibility for your sense of concern to arise. And this is where I think you know, the current collaboration between Buddhist scholars on the one hand and psychologists and neuroscientists on the other, which is taking more place in, the, in, in America more than here, I think it has a lot of promise because when it comes to studying mental phenomena like compassion, you know, at one of the Stanford meetings, um, which I helped organize, you know, I, I had the temerity to remind the scientists that when it comes to studying mental phenomena, please do not be arrogant. You cannot act as if this is an untrodden territory. You know, for thousands of years, world's great religious traditions and philosophers have been thinking about this. And in any case, when you, although you may have more empirical, you know, as dimensions to your thinking, but at the end of the day, the, the, so long as you participate in the use of common language, like English, terms like compassion, empathy, sympathy, altruism, are going to come from an existing meaning framework which has been deeply informed and shaped by pre-existing tradition. So you cannot act as if the slate is completely clean. And also another thing that scientists really need to avoid is the tendency to reduce. Because when it comes to studying qualities like compassion and altruism, in the end, these are qualities that matter a lot to us as part of our self-definition of who we are as a species. So it's, 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 there's a moral responsibility on the part of the scientists who are doing this kind of research not to jump the gun 
And, you know, so for example, like if you look at, say, the study of altruism, already there is a little bit of balkanization. The same term is used differently. The zoologist and primatologist and economist will use the term in such a way it has nothing to do with intention. It's altruism is a helping behavior that is costly to the person, to the agent. That's all that is. Whereas if you talk to the psychologists and philosophers and Buddhist thinkers, altruism has everything to do with intention. If the, intention, if the primary intention is to help the other, it's an altruistic behavior. If the primary interest is to help yourself, even though act may seem altruistic, it's not genuine altruism. So already different you know, definitions are coming up. So I think here, um, um, you know, for studies of mental phenomena like compassion, there needs to be a lot more interdisciplinary you know, approach so that this field can move forward. And for compassion, I think, you know, I, I, I genuinely hope uh, that the presence of Dalai Lama Center for Compassion here in Oxford particularly will really allow not just pushing this, promoting further this discourse on compassion and understanding its place within our conception of who we are more clearly and more deeply, but also trying to draw out the larger societal implications of what it means. You know, because up until now, we have created social structures and societal institutions and so on based on a particular picture of human nature. And if there were any restraints brought in, they were brought in as if to put a lid on this beastly side of our nature. But if we're going to take seriously that alongside this competitive self-interest pursuits, you know, part of us, there is also this nurturing, connecting with others and cooperative behavior that is part of our fundamental makeup, that has to have implications for the kind of society we will create, for the kind of education we will develop for our children, and for the kind of environment and also the whole vision of what it means to live a happy life. That has to have an implication. And these are, I think, things that probably needs to be flushed out in a much more scholarly, research deeper uh, way and, and institutions like Oxford is really best place to do it because particularly um, you know unlike American university system Cambridge and Oxford one of the beauty is that because of the college system you know each college is almost a world in itself you have so many you know scholars and experts from different disciplines represented together in one area which is very very unusual so this kind of multidisciplinary work is really you know, much more suited in a setting like Oxford and Cambridge. So I hope that um, you know, all the academics who are here and students will take advantage of the Dalai Lama Center here. And I hope the Dalai Lama Center will take advantage of this very unique nature of Oxford kind of you know, academic life so that this conversation on compassion can be promoted further. And personally, I also believe that, you know, it's sort of a cliche to say we are now living in a truly global village. Um, but one of the, the dangers of that, and which we are already beginning to see, is that many different visions of society is going to come together. Um, you know, people are talking about clash of civilizations. I'm not so sure about that. But at least there is going to be conflicting perspectives of what society, how society should be structured. And in this kind of, and then multiplicity of religions are going to come together. And I believe that in this kind of world, compassion really offers one of the very rare opportunities to really come together. Compassion is one area where I don't think there will be much differences between, say, Islamic traditions and Buddhist traditions and Christian traditions and you know, Jewish traditions and Hindu traditions. You know, and if you look at the kind of you know, conceptualization of the divinity in all the theistic religions, compassion and mercy really comes fairly on the top. So that suggests that there is a genuine admiration of that quality. And in the theistic tradition in particular, uh, human beings who are seen as creatures of divinity are seen as, you know, their, our role is being seen as the best served by trying to emulate, you know, the divinity's kind of character. And if compassion and, 
you know, um, altruism uh, the, you know, one of the most important characteristics that would also be seen as a best way of religion, living that kind of you know, vision of life. So it, in, in brief, I genuinely believe that discourse on compassion really offers one of the very rare opportunities where perspectives from different backgrounds can really come together at a level where we are talking about shared common human aspirations and human experience. And, um, you know, my book, I was supposed to talk more about my book, but yeah, I didn't say much. But, um, you know, my, you know, basically my book is divided into three parts. The first part really tries to make the case uh, for compassion. And I try to also tease out uh, the whole conceptual issues of how do we define compassion as opposed to empathy, what is the connection between compassion and kindness and altruism, and so on. And also, I also uh, provide lot references to a lot of the new findings that are coming from the research on well-being and happiness, where increasingly it is becoming clear that if we are serious about you know, pursuing our happiness, truly happy life, compassion really seems to be the key and I've called it the best kept secret of happiness. Uh, and it's kind of a paradox. And in some sense it's a paradox, but in some sense it's actually, it makes sense because if we think about our, our life, the happiest moments that we can remember are the moments when we have learned to forget ourselves. Just, just think about it. You know, even in a kind of a, a mundane thing like going to a party, if we are not thinking about ourselves, if we are not self-conscious, we are enjoying it. The moment we are self-conscious, we don't enjoy, we become nervous, you know, we, we feel as if we have a sense of ourselves being looked at us from outside. It's a weird feeling. And, but when you lose yourself, that's when you are happy. And compassion offers the best way to forget about yourself because you, you feel deeply connected with someone in front of you. And furthermore, compassion, because the key ingredient really is a sense of connection with someone important in your life, someone who's in front of you, compassion is also one of the best buffer against the dangers of loneliness. And loneliness is increasingly becoming a big issue uh, in the West. There was a 2012 study from UK based on a study of um, old people's home. And um, one in five members of the residential homes report being lonely acutely at least several times a day. And after five year study period, that number has increased. And another study that came out from the States showed that acute loneliness and its connection to mortality is as bad, if not worse, uh, as smoking and obesity. So. I don't think we as human beings are meant to live a lonely life. You know, we are deeply social creatures and this is one area where people in the West can learn something from the traditional societies. You know, in traditional societies people are very, very rarely lonely because the way in which they see themselves, they interact, it's, it's a very social life. So I think compassion really holds the key to a lot of this. I'm not going to go into this. So uh, the second part of the book is really about the compassion training program that I developed at Stanford and the whole framework of the psychology which draws both from the Buddhist psychology as well as contemporary psychology. And the third part is the way in which I see, you know, so how, if all of this is possible, so what does it mean to live compassion? A compassionate life on a day-to-day -day basis. So I try to spell that out on the individual level and then envision it in a more societal level as well. So the basic point I was trying to make in this book is in some sense quite simple. Compassion is natural, it's part of our natural makeup. It's good for us and we can do something about it so that it becomes a more active force in our everyday life. That's basically the book so that you don't have to buy it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. I thought it was a wonderful uh, digression on, uh, the, uh, on the subject of your book.
Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Kerry Smallman, who's going to field some questions. Uh, anybody who's got any questions, please. Anyone got any questions? Just put your hand up. Yes, um, I want to thank you for that nice, elaborate explanation. Um, I was thinking, you know, some of the uh, spiritual paths, they emphasize first getting rid of the ego. And then once the ego is eroded, these qualities like compassion, altruism, kindness will naturally grow. But um, I'm understanding uh, from you that it is also possible to first practice. Yes, yes. And then we'll get the same result. Yes, sure, sure, sure. That is the case. Sure. I would actually argue that, um, you know, trying to get rid of ego first so that natural qualities like compassion becomes more manifest is a probably a tougher route. It is, it is. Whereas, you know, trying to live a compassionate life where you emphasize your sense of connection with others. You allow that part of your nature to express itself and also make a choice to interact with others and relate to your own life from that place of compassion. That also takes care of dealing with the excesses, the problem of excesses ego. So, you know, because in the, in the process of making connection with others, opening your heart, you have a bigger space in which you know you see your own situation and condition in within the wide in, within the larger context of your connection with others so it's a much more natural way of dealing with the problem of ego yeah. whereas the other approach is you know involves a bit more reflective quiet sitting and yeah. and a lot of you know work kind of cognitive it takes a work. long time yeah. Yeah. thank you well, if Kerry directs me to where the question is, <laughs> and then I can take the microphone over, is that possible? Yeah. There was one there. There's the there behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was inspiring. So, I'm the research manager for the Mindfulness in Schools project in the UK. And we have a lesson on appreciation in, within the context of the Mindfulness in Schools course. I'm really interested to know what you think about teaching compassion skills in school settings and how you might evaluate that. I mean, how do you evaluate the effect of the course that you've created for sure. adults? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think that this is a very, very important question because I know in the wake of this enthusiasm for mindfulness in, in the West, um, there's a lot of opportunity um, in you know in the in the in both in the UK as well as North America, so my appeal to the mindfulness community has been to try to see if they can also bring the you know additional component of compassion and empathy in that kind of larger you know um, training. Actually, my wife uh, she teaches uh, social emotional learning uh, in a private school in Montreal. She has been teaching this for the last eight years and. Um, um, I think part of the, 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 the thinking really has to be, because in, in the West, we are so action-oriented. And when we think about compassion, we immediately think, think in terms of doing something. So, uh, and here, I think there needs to be a little bit of more sophisticated take on you know, compassion, so that we do not immediately equate being compassionate with doing something. So, you know, we can, and there I think we probably need to have a way of coding the language is one way. You know, when you, uh, when, when, when a child talks about another friend and, you know, whether, the, you know, you can, you can develop a coding system where how much of the empathetic connection comes through and how much of that language is, you know, influenced by kind of egocentric uh, needs or how much of language is infected by kind of negative judgment. So there are probably languages, coding language is one way of evaluating this. Um, one of the things that has been very effective in my wife's work is she teaches something that is based on nonviolent communication, which is a Western you know, uh, discipline that was developed by Marshall Rosenberg, partly inspired by Buddhist tradition. 
uh, Marshall was very influenced by Theravada Buddhism. And Marshall's work involves what he calls developing emotional liter literacy. So being able to name the complexities of your emotion and then connecting these basic emotions with what he calls basic needs, which are basically shared universal aspirations for safety, for happiness, for joy, whatever it is. And, and he has this idea that when negative emotions are expressed, they're actually coming from a place of pain because there were some aspirations that were not met or violated and then you act out. And so, so you connect these feelings with these needs and then you learn it first with yourself, about yourself. Once the child learns about this with herself or her, himself, then they are able to make that connection with others and it gives a powerful conflict resolution tool where children who has gone through this kind of training, when they are arguing and having a fight, adult brings them together and lets them sit in front of, front of the adult and each child has to guess the, what the other child was feeling and what was, what, where was that feeling coming from. The fact that you have to guess your opponent's feeling and the underlying needs immediately makes it possible to understand and within a few minutes the conflict is resolved. So there are these things where I think it's more than mindfulness. I think you need children at a very early age. I'm not a developmental psychologist, but having been part of Mind and Life for such a long time, you know, constantly in communication with scientists, one of the things is that early childhood, the cognitive development is not that advanced. But the social side of the brain is very, very rich because it's so important for the child to be able to detect whether her mother's angry or not, whether that expression coming from this man is dangerous or not. I mean, this is, it's for survival. The social cues, the emotional, you know, expressions are so important. So therefore, early childhood intervention or whatever we're going to bring in really ha needs to involve using to optimal level the skills that are already there in children. And there, I think, some kind of empathy based or compassion based approach would really make a big difference in addition to bringing mindfulness. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there's one there. Thank Steve, yeah. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the talk immensely. May I ask you about compassion and war? The way I see it, compassion has two clear roles, if we can educate the children, catch them uh, young enough and um, train them in compassion or bring out their natural tendency to compassion, they'll be less likely to be militaristic or less inclined to uh, not identify with the, with, with the other and take human life or cause human suffering. And then at the other end, I can see a role for compassion in dealing with the, the casualties of war yes. in every sense of casualties the bereaved, the sure. injured, the, the physically injured, the emotionally uh, injured, and so on. But what about in between? Supposing the war is underway and the people are already killing one another, they're already not identifying uh, with the other, and they're utterly intent on uh, taking human life and causing suffering in the situation. They're imbued with hatred and vengeance and negativity. Is, could there be any role for um, compassion in this in-between situation, so to speak, not before and not after, but, but during? That's a very, very difficult question. Yeah. Um. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not asking you. I, never, I often don't ask questions. I don't, I've true, got no sure. idea how to answer questions. Um, you know, that sort of the, 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 my intuition tells me there has to be a role. Yeah. Yeah. But the question is, yeah. how, how would that role be and, and how to make that happen because part of the problem in in war when you're in the middle of it both sides have reached a point where they is they're very difficult to see the humanity of the other other side it's just it's become too rarefied you know they're too, kind of too solidified uh, the whole yeah. kind of perception of the other and on top of that, group mentality kicks in. And in, in, in group, 
things, people can do things horribly. You know, we saw that in the football, you know, kind of, you know, violence in, in this country. And this is where, if you look at the individuals themselves, you know, they may be not a problem, but in a group, sometimes this kind of, uh, you know, uh, mentality kicks in. That's one thing. The second is um, the sense of victimhood and sense of, you know, um, vengeance. You know, that is part of the narrative. And the self-defense, again, is so powerful when you're in the middle of the war. Um, I, it's very difficult to bring compassion immediately. The, I think the only way in which compassion can play a role is if some kind of temporary ceasefire is brought. And that probably needs to happen from some external intervention, you know, a third party getting involved so that there is a temporary kind of reprieve for the time being, which then allows for the more saner part of the human you know, brain and also the members, member of the two communities to start you know, being able to use that part of the brain. Because otherwise, I think it's very difficult to imagine how compassion can play a role. Thank there. you very much. Thank very you. useful. Okay, just take one more question, I think. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it's lovely to see compassion coming to the fore in the public debate in, the de in, in, in many ways of which you're expressing it uh, in the development on the back of the interest in mindfulness over the last 10, 20 years, I suppose. Um, my, one of my personal interests has always been really the combination coming from an interest in, in, in really from Tibetan Buddhism, the combination of uh, the philosophical uh, um, area of looking into the construction of self and the construction of the object as being a very significant way of understanding uh, a sub a, an intellectual or conceptual support for the rationale behind applying universal compassion. Yes. Now, clearly in um, across cultures and different traditions, compassion is the broad uh, overlapping element. But um, I would ask you do you see the, the, the role of uh, the philosophical aspect that comes out of uh, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Indian Buddhist tradition, as having a role that may emerge, uh, if you like, in the, way, in the wake of the interest of compassion, in the way that compassion has emerged in the wake of the, inter in the interest of mindfulness in the next decade or two? Thank you. Um... <clears throat> Philosophical side, um, I don't know. It's it's difficult, but there is a kind of an uh, an, uh, an area where the philosophy and psychology kind of fuses together in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Uh, you're talking about recognition of how much of what we think to be real are basically constructs. Um, that is now already there. For example, if you look at cognitive behavior therapy. Um, a large part of that therapy involves reinterpreting a particular experience. And also one of the most powerful thing about mind, you know, mindfulness, the modern mindfulness movement, is the ability that you teach the individual to recognize that your thoughts are just thoughts. You know, the contents of your thoughts do not necessarily reflect reality and you don't need to completely believe in it and you learn to distance yourself from it and look at it in a dispassionate way. So already these things are happening and there are some kind of elements of Buddhist kind of fusion of philosophy and psychology. I mean, one of the things, you know, I also noticed is that, for example, um, you know, it's very prominent in cognitive behavior therapy, which is the re recognition of the intimate connection between our thoughts and attitudes and our experience and emotions and then how we behave. That's at the heart of Buddhist psychology. You know, Buddha talked about how we create our own world and we are our own master. So essentially what the Buddha is saying is that we may be physically living in exactly the same environment, but depending upon how we see the world, each one is going to experience the world differently. And that intimate connection between our perception of the world, attitudes that we bring, the values that you know, you know, influence us, really shape the way in which we literally experience the world, which then impacts the way we behave because 
you know, underlying all the motives for human action, the most powerful ones are emotion. You know, this is a discovery in the West is made fairly recently. In the East, you know, emotion has been recognized as an important part of the motivation system long ago. In the West, up until quite recently, the primary kind of approach to understanding human kind of motivation was really about choice theory, which is very rational. You know, I mean, there are whole philosophy about rational choice theory. And it's only recently, I mean, there, uh, Antonio Damasio wrote a book called Descartes' Error, you know, which really made the case that, you know, without understanding emotions, you can't understand human behavior, because the key motivating factors are really emotions. Uh, and so, so, so the way we see our world shapes the way we experience, which is our emotion. That shapes the way in which we behave, and by changing the way we see the world, we change the way we experience it, which then change the way we behave. And also there is a backward relation. By changing the way we behave, it also changes the way we experience. So there is a kind of a very interconnected relationship. And those are really coming, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, they are much more explicitly articulated than in the Western thought. But now you can see that in cognitive behavior therapy and many other practices. So I think I don't know about, I mean, people ask me about what do you think of Buddhist theory of emptiness and, you know, no self. No self is a tall order. <laughs> it really is a tall order. I mean, you know, the, and I don't know, I mean, the, the, the suggestion that somehow you can have a coherent experience of the entire, you know, your, your, your experience without any first personal pronoun based framework is almost inconceivable. But some particular reading of Buddhist tradition does make that suggestion. But will that have any application in the secular world? I don't know. But on the other hand, theory of interdependent origination, dependent origin, that really has a powerful role. And already if you look at systemic thinking uh, and complex you know, uh, theories about complexity, there is already a lot of, you know, I don't know whether the influence is explicit or not, I don't know, but there's, there are views which are very similar to the Buddhist idea of dependent origination. So, that, so the, the dynamic relationships do not go in one direction, but there is a kind of a multiple levels of connection. And those ideas have also shaped powerfully the whole environmental philosophy. So, so Buddhism is really interacting with contemporary Western thought in a very, very creative way. And I think this will go on, uh, and you know, hopefully for the betterment of the world. Thank you.